One, two, three, four. Oh, hello. In a scene described by one investigator as reminiscent of a weird religious rite, five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. Miss Tate, who starred in Valley of the Dolls, was eight months pregnant. A wandering band of members of a so-called religious cult with a leader they called Jesus has had three of its followers arrested in the investigation of the murder of Sharon Tate and six others. I remember when we first went in, one of the people said, who are you? And Tex said, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. He never heard you express remorse. Have you never felt it? Remorse for what? You people have done everything in the world to me. Doesn't that give me equal right? I can do anything I want to you people at any time I want to, because that's what you've done to me. This is Sharon Tate, who plays the role of Jennifer in Valley of the Dolls. Sharon, you're a Texas girl, aren't you? Yes, I was born in Dallas. How much time did you spend there? No time. No time at all. I went from there to Washington State and then to Italy. But we can still claim you in Texas. Sure. <laughs> Manson desperately wanted to be famous, and after becoming friends with the Beach Boys drummer Dennis Wilson in 1968, they started collaborating. I didn't go to them. They came to me. You're stealing my music every day. You're writing my songs. You're playing my game. Not really, Mr. Manson. Listen, the Beach Boys did not pursue Charles Manson. In fact, he pursued them with what you could call a deadly zeal. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this episode of Masters of Rock Talk is different from what we usually do. I'm flying solo today. There's a very odd moment in the history of rock and roll, and it's a somber moment indeed. And it concerns that time in the late 1960s in Southern California, near Los Angeles, when Charles Manson got uncomfortably close to the Beach Boys. So stay with me. As Betty Davis once said, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Okay, before we start talking about rock and roll and the Beach Boys, let me do a kind of Wikipedia thumbnail of Charles Manson. Uh, he's born 1934, died 2017. He was an American criminal cult and musician cult leader, rather, a musician who led the Manson family, a cult based in Southern California in the late 1960s. Some of the members committed a series of at least nine murders at four locations in July and August of 1969. In 1971, Manson was convicted of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for the deaths of seven people, including the film actress Sharon Tate. The prosecution contended that while Manson never directly ordered the murders, his ideology constituted an overt act of conspiracy. Manson often cited the two major influences in his mind control techniques were Dale Carnegie's perennial bestseller, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and Scientology. Manson studied Scientology for at least 150 hours. He left because he, quote, found it too weird. Unquote. Poor L. Ron Hubbard. I mean, you're in trouble when Charles Manson finds your teaching too weird. That says something. Okay, that was a thumbnail sketch of Charles Manson. You noticed that description carries the term musician. Okay, let's flip over to the Beach Boys. They were one of the most powerful rock groups in the 1960s, an all-American squeaky clean band, at least in the beginning, matching uniforms. Um, their Pet Sounds album, That'd be from 1966. It's constantly celebrated as one of the best albums of all time, and I think it is. There were three Wilson brothers in the Beach Boys, Dennis, Brian Wilson, the writer, and Carl. Dennis was the drummer. Carl had a, probably the best voice. Dennis was also the group's only surfer. 
Which was an irony, because the Beach Boys were always promoted as a surf band, at least in, in, in the beginning anyway, until it was 65, 66. And Dennis, kind of a good-looking guy, beautiful tan, nice long golden locks, uh, he, and he promoted the surfing lifestyle. In 1968, Dennis Wilson inadvertently met the Manson family when he picked up two young women who were hitchhiking along Sunset Boulevard in Malibu. One of them at the time was pregnant. Wilson offered to give them a ride, but a month later he saw the same two women again. This time, the woman that had been pregnant now had her baby with her. Wilson was happy for her and the child and decided to bring both women and the child back to his home. The women turned out to be Patricia Krenwinkel and Ella Jo Bailey of the Manson family. Then Wilson went to a recording session. When he returned about 3 a.m., he was met in his driveway by a complete stranger, Charles Manson. Manson welcomed Wilson into his own home by dropping to his knees and kissing his feet, a tactic he had used to disarm people before. When Wilson went into his home, about a dozen people were occupying the place. Most of them were female, many were nude, Dennis became fascinated by Manson and his followers. The family lived with him. He burned through about $100,000 in cash. Now keep in mind, this is 1968. Just supplying the family with cars, clothes, food, and penicillin shots for their persistent sexual diseases. At that time, Wilson said to a journalist, quote, I told the girls about our involvement with the Maharishi. He's talking about the Beach Boys, their involvement with the Maharishi, and they told me they too had a guru, a guy named Charlie, who had recently come out of jail after 12 years. He had drifted into crime, but when I met him, I found he had great musical ideas. We're writing music together now. He's dumb in some ways, but I accept his approach, and I've learned from him, unquote. Diane Lake, who was 14 when she joined, says Manson exploited the women to further his personal ambition. Charlie really was pimping us out, but it was in the name of, oh, freeing your sexual inhibition. So initially, he was impressed by Manson's songwriting talent, and Dennis introduced him to a few friends in the music business, including producer Terry Melcher. And I'll speak about Terry Melcher later on in this podcast, because although it's somewhat hazy, he played a role in the whole grisly tale. All right, Charles Manson and the Beach Boys. So Manson went to Brian Wilson's home studio and recorded some songs he had written. Eventually, the Beach Boys released one of those songs that Manson had titled Cease to Exist, and they reworded, reworked it rather as Never Learn Not to Love as a B-side on the album 2020, which was released in February of 69. The other Beach Boys were creeped out by Manson. Singer Mike Love later wrote in his memoir, Good Vibrations, about how he went over to Dennis Wilson's for dinner, only to find everybody there naked. The after-dinner LSD-fueled orgy was a little too much to take, so he excused himself to have a shower. But Manson barged in on him and scolded him for leaving. Boy, that's the memory, eh? You're in there showering away, and Charles Manson comes in to the washroom, and he's mad at you. And you wouldn't forget that easily. Van Dyke Parks, who wrote some great lyrics for the Beach Boys, said, quote, One day Charles Manson brought a bullet out and showed it to Dennis, who asked, What's this? And Manson replied, It's a bullet. I want you to look at it, and every time you look at it, I want you to think how nice it is your kids are still safe and well. Dennis grabbed Manson by the head and threw him to the ground and began pummeling him until Charlie said stop. He beat the living hell out of Manson. How dare you, was Dennis's reaction. Charlie Manson was weeping openly in front of a lot of hip people. I heard about it. I wasn't there. The point is, though, Dennis Wilson wasn't afraid of anybody, unquote. As Dennis became increasingly aware of Manson's volatile nature and his uh, violent tendencies, he finally made a break from the friendship by simply moving out of the house, which was rented. Boy, he left a little bit of trouble for his uh, landlord. So he moved out. When Manson subsequently sought further contact and money, he left a bullet with Dennis's housekeeper to be delivered with a cryptic message, which Dennis perceived as a threat. No kidding. In August of 69, 
family members committed the Tate LaBianca murders. For the remainder of his life, Dennis rarely discussed his involvement with the Manson family. For instance, in 1976, he told the journalist, quote, as long as I live, I'll never talk about that, unquote. What has fascinated people about Manson then and now is the gripping stranglehold he held over his followers. Incredibly, he still has that hold over some of them to this very day. One of them is Sandra Good, an original Manson family member who today lives near the prison just so she can be close to Charles Manson. She is still fighting for him. The crime, the so-called, those weren't crimes. That was war. That was a holy war. Okay. Let's zero in on the supporting cast. Terry Melcher, born 1942, he was a musician and record producer who was instrumental in shaping uh, the California sound at that time, the American West Coast rock music, really. He gained acclaim by producing Paul Revere and the Raiders, and especially the Birds. I think he produced the first two Birds albums, which hit the biggest hits. He was the only child of actress and singer Doris Day. For a while, Melcher was interested in recording Mance's music, as well as making a film about the family and their hippie commune existence. Now, we get into the fog of war, so to speak. It has been claimed by reputable sources that Manson met Melcher at 10,050 Cielo Drive, the home Melcher shared with his girlfriend, actress Candace Bergen, along with musician Mark Lindsay from Paul Revere and the Raiders. Manson eventually auditioned for Melcher, but Melcher declined to sign him. There was still talk of making a documentary about Manson's music, but Melcher abandoned the project after witnessing Manson become embroiled in a fight with a drunken stuntman at Spawn Ranch. So yes, Terry Melcher went to Spawn Ranch and even brought a portable studio with him. And he recorded Manson on guitar with some of the uh, Mansonites girls doing background. Both Wilson and Melcher severed their ties with Manson, a move that obviously angered Manson. Not long after splitting from Manson, Melcher and Bergen moved out of the Cielo Drive home. The house's owner, Rudy Adabelli, then leased it to film director Roman Polanski and his wife, actress Sharon Tate. Okay, some authors and law enforcement personnel have theorized the Cielo Drive house was targeted by Manson as revenge for Melcher's rejection and that Manson was unaware that he and Bergen had moved out. However, family member Charles Tex Watson stated that Manson and company did know that Melcher was no longer living there. Additionally, Terry's former roommate, Mark Lindsay, stated, quote, everybody speculated that Manson sent his minions up there to get rid of Terry Melcher because he was angry about not getting a record deal. But Terry and I talked about it later, and Terry said Manson knew he had moved out because Manson or someone from his organization left a note on Terry's porch in Malibu. So when the police arrested Manson, the media reported he had sent his followers to the house to kill Melcher and Bergen. Manson family member Susan Atkins, who admitted her part in the murders, stated to police and before a grand jury that they chose the house to, quote, instill fear into Terry Melcher because Terry had given us his word on a few things and he never came through with them, unquote. In this aim, I guess, in this objective, the Manson family was successful. Terry Melcher employed a bodyguard and told Manson prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi uh, that his fear was so great he had been undergoing psychiatric care. He seemed to be the most frightened of the witnesses at the trial, even though Bugliosi assured him that Manson knew he was no longer living at Cielo Drive. Melcher testified to both the grand jury on December 5th, 1969, and during the People v. Charles Watson, Tex Watson, on Monday, August 23rd, 1971. Tex was tried later. I think he took off to, he was hiding out in Texas and they finally had to deport him, kick him out of Texas, take him into California. So the trials are staggered. Okay, this is a quote from Charles Manson. Kids respond to music. They can hear it. They're not so conditioned they can't feel it. Music seldom gets to grown-ups. It gets through to the young mind that's still open. Unquote. There you go. Manson learned to play the guitar in the federal penitentiary when he was serving time for various offenses. He was taught by Alvin Karpus, a member of a Depression-era gang run by Ma Barker. 
By the time Manson emerged as a nascent cult leader in San Francisco during the Summer of Love, he'd become a prolific songwriter. He bound his family together with group sex and psychedelic drug trips, the relinquishing of possessions and ties to the so-called straight world. And he used the transgressive thrill of creepy crawling, which was sneaking into wealthy homes to rearrange the furniture and commit minor thefts. And he used his songs, too. The family sang his lyrics as they scavenged for food in dumpsters. They harmonized with Manson around campfires at Spawn Ranch. And they eventually crooned the songs in their cell while serving life sentences. As I mentioned earlier, Meltzer recorded some of the biggest hits by the Birds and Paul Revere and the Raiders, and he auditioned Manson, keep that in mind, for Columbia Records. Dennis Wilson, as I said, recorded Manson, and Dennis considered signing him to the Beach Boys' Brother Records label, but thankfully, that fell through. I remember reading somewhere where Brian Wilson's wife just caught a look at Manson, and that was it for Manson, recording at their house. So when Dennis, in quotes, stole one of Manson's songs, it was believed to be in payback for, the, for Manson taking over $100,000 from him. Phil Kaufman, who did time with Manson in prison and then managed Graham Parsons, those of you might know that uh, he was responsible for, um, how could I say, handling Parsons' body after uh, Parson died of a, a drug overdose. Phil Kaufman eventually worked for a roadie for the Rolling Stones, Emmy Lou Harris, Frank Zappa, and others. He recorded, for, uh, I guess, about 14 acoustic demos of Manson's songs, and they were released in 1970. I think he paid for a few thousand copies to get pressed. You can hear, hear all this stuff on YouTube. Neil Young thought that Manson was, quote, great, unreal, unquote, and he told the head of Warner Brother Records that all Manson needed was, quote, a band like Dylan Head on subterranean homesick blues. Poor Neil. Neil also gifted Manson a motorcycle. Poor Neil. With Manson, there's another angle to rock music, and this is it. The helter-skelter race war theory is today recognized as the most likely motive of the Tate and LaBianca murders of 1969. Many of Manson's followers have openly discussed Helter Skelter. The theory was really promoted by the Los Angeles County Assistant District Attorney I've mentioned, Vincent Bugliosi, and it supported the entire trial and conviction of Charles Manson. Here's a quote from former Manson follower Catherine Scher, quote, When the Beatles' White Album came out, Charlie listened to it over and over again. He was quite certain the Beatles had tapped into his spirit, the truth, that everything was going to come down and the black man was going to rise. It wasn't that Charlie listened to the White Album and started following what he thought the Beatles were saying. It was the other way around. He thought the Beatles were talking about what he had been expounding for years. Every single song on the White Album, he felt that they were singing about us. The song Helter Skelter, he was interpreting to mean that the blacks were going to go up, rise up, and the whites were going to go down, unquote. In his book Helter Skelter, The True Story of the Manson Murders, Bugliosi believed that Helter Skelter represented a coming race war where African Americans would rise up and go to war with white America. And somehow... Uh, Manson and his family would be hiding out in the desert, survive it, and come back and rule the world. It's been disputed whether Manson actually ever believed this, or he just used it to hold the, this family of misfits together. According to Bugliosi, Manson believed that the Beatles were communicating to him through the music and were warning him of a coming helter-skelter. Let's move on. The writer Joan Didion thought that the 1960s ended with the Manson murders. I don't think so. I think the 1960s really ended with Watergate. Anyway, it's my feeling that Manson's failed attempt to become a professional musician in some way contributed to the deaths of Sharon Tate and the others. But it wasn't the core reason by far. Charles Manson obviously was severely mentally ill. Who knows what would have set him off? There were a lot of guys wandering around Los Angeles at that time with guitars singing folk songs. If you want a sampling of Manson's head, just go to YouTube. All the Phil Coffin recordings are there. You know, and so we leave this strange, dangerous little span in rock and roll history. All the vectors cross at exactly the wrong moment to produce this terrible phenomenon known as Charles Manson. One corollary is the rock and roll angle. We have Dennis Wilson, we have Charles Manson as a musician, and we have the role of the Beatles' White Album, which he believed was sending him coded messages. And more strange, vice versa. 
So if you're interested in more information with the Manson family, I highly recommend the book simply called The Family by Ed Sanders. It is by far the best book I've read on this grisly subject. And I want to thank you for joining the Masters of Rock Talk podcast today. I hope you found this subject as interesting as I do. And please return for further episodes that express unique angles on this incredible music we call rock and roll. I'm Dr. Ian Clark. 